So the next paper is by uh, Dave, uh, 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 David Duong from University of uh, uh, Zurich. So he will talk about uh, import competition. Thank you. We started in the morning by seeing uh, evidence on the rising incomes at the very top of the distribution where capital income is an important part of the income portfolio. Once we move further down in the distribution, then labor income is by far the dominating source of income. However, of course, in order to get labor income, people first need to have a job. And so what we're doing in this paper is to look at employment in the US labor market. This is joint work with uh, Achimoglu, author and price of MIT and Gordon Hansen of UC San Diego. When we look at the uh, ratio of employment over population in the US labor market in uh, uh, the last few decades, we see that after a long period of rising employment rates, after a long period of rising employment rates, uh, there was a notable drop off in employment, of course, in the Great Recession, but perhaps uh, 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 quite strikingly, employment already started a slow decline in the 2000s previous to the Great Recession. In a uh, Brookings uh, paper article, Bob Moffitt looks at a large uh, uh, group of potential explanations for this uh, uh, reversal in employment rates. He looks at uh, uh, changes in, uh, in uh, tax and transfer policies, changes in demographics, changes in various uh, uh, economic forces. The only one factor that seems to have some explanatory power in explaining this decline in employment is falling wages, especially for low-skilled males, which are then associated also with falling employment. But of course, if wages are falling, then the question is why do we see uh, uh, this uh, joint decline in wages and employment? In this paper, uh, uh, we uh, uh, first looked at some disaggregation of these employment to population uh, patterns uh, into the contributions of different industries, something which uh, uh, was interestingly missing in, uh, in Bob Moffitt's paper. When we look at that, we see here on the very right-hand side the overall decline in employment over population in the 2000s with the black uh, bar and you see that a lot of that actually comes from a decline in manufacturing the big blue bar. Uh, in the earlier periods uh, to the left, you see that much of uh, uh, that decline already happened uh, between 2000 and 2007 prior to the Great Recession. Um, here is a, a, a compilation of, uh, of numbers uh, uh, just putting some, uh, some values to uh, these things. If we uh, uh, extrapolate the counterfactual scenario where the growth uh, of the 1990s persists through uh, the uh, 2000s, then by the start of the Great Recession, we would have had 2 million additional jobs in manufacturing still and uh, even more additional jobs outside of manufacturing. Now, Given that we see that uh, an important fraction of the decline in, uh, in employment seems to be in manufacturing, we're exploring in this paper the contribution of one potential source of such an uh, employment change, which comes from international trade. The big change in uh, international trade patterns in the last two decades was the very, very rapid emergence of China as a major uh, exporting uh, power. Um, China uh, uh, has, when we look at the bilateral trade relationship to the United States, uh, increased its exports in, uh, of goods in real value by a factor of about 12 between the start of the 1990s and the year 2007. And in the, while there was a small dip in these uh, uh, exports in the Great Recession, there have been new record levels of exports in 2010, 11, 12, and 13. 
US exports to China uh, uh, compared to that <coughs> operate at a much lower level. Also, uh, a US service trade with China, which is not shown here, is much smaller in volume. Now, uh, much of that uh, dramatic growth of China seems to come through uh, as a result of a series of reforms uh, in China that were initiated in the 1980s and then started to take hold in the 1990s and 2000s, which uh, uh, turned China into a, a, a very uh, from, a, from a very low productivity economy to a economy that actually is very, very strong and competitive, at least in a subset of industries. Now, there are a, a number of previous studies that have looked at an impact of Chinese import competition on employment in US industries or uh, different geographic regions in the United States. Uh, and all of those studies find that uh, this import competition seems to contribute somewhat to the manufacturing employment decline. Uh, uh, not surprisingly, it doesn't explain all of it. In other work that uh, I've done with, uh, with uh, some of the same co-authors, we also show that technological change has, manu has affected manufacturing uh, quite strongly. But one limitation of all these type of research where one tries to take a macroeconomic shock, these big uh, uh, changes in trade patterns, and then tries to uh, uh, get the uh, economic effect of those by comparing different industries or different regions which are differentially exposed to those shocks. The big challenge in interpreting uh, the results from such studies is that while we can do relatively good quantitative comparisons uh, between the employment effect on a more trade exposed versus a less trade exposed industries, it's quite difficult to move from that relative comparison to an absolute statement about total employment effects. <laughs> Specifically, the challenge here is that an industry, for instance, that might not be facing direct import competition might nevertheless have uh, uh, employment effects uh, that are felt there due to the trade shock, but that happen through more indirect uh, channels. Now, what we're trying to do in this paper is to capture some of these indirect channels. Specifically, we're uh, <coughs> relating, uh, we're decomposing a national employment impact that comes through this import competition from China into four components, and we're trying to capture all or some of these components in three different empirical uh, uh, exercises. The first of these is the, the most traditional approach, which is that we measure the differential exposure of industries to uh, trade competition from China and uh, uh, look at the direct impact that this competition has on employment in those industries. In the second part of the analysis, we try to capture indirect effects that operate because industries within the United States sell goods and services to each other and buy goods and services to each other. So we're asking what happens if someone's suppliers or someone's customers are directly affected by uh, this trade exposure. The final piece is the one that's hardest to capture. Namely, the possibility that when uh, uh, workers in a firm, for instance, might lose their job because of trade exposure to that firm, these workers might move to other industries which then experience rising employment. So, for instance, when a manufacturing uh, plant in some city collapses, then some of these workers might end up working in a restaurant. Or else, and that's the second piece here, if these uh, manufacturing workers lose their jobs, they might actually no longer spend as much money on eating out in the restaurant, which then might lead to uh, employment cuts in the restaurant. So those are uh, uh, additional effects that might be operating, and we're trying to capture a spatially local component of these effects by comparing the uh, uh, consequences of trade on differentially exposed uh, uh, geographic labor markets. Now, um, 
I should say here uh, uh, that even as we try to advance beyond uh, previous research by bringing in some of these uh, indirect linkages, there is always another additional uh, layer or additional layers of further linkages uh, that uh, are left out. In our analysis, notably, what we don't have in there is the effect of, uh, of US export behavior and uh, services trade. What we know about these, however, is that they're relatively small in volume compared to the large goods imports from China. We also don't have uh, international trade relationships that go across many corners. And what is also missing uh, uh, and, uh, and beyond the scope here is effects that operate through impacts of trade on prices or interest levels that then in turn might have uh, employment effects. Uh, that is not to say that such uh, effects might not matter, but uh, an important challenge is that measurement uh, uh, on these dimensions is very difficult. We then continue by characterizing uh, the trade exposure at the level of a industry. Uh, uh, in other work, we've shown that one can use uh, a class of trade models to get to an expression that looks somewhat like this equation here, which is the growth in the value of imports that a US industry J gets from China over some time period tau expressed as a multiple of the initial US market volume of goods of that industries. Now, I said earlier, we think that a big reason why China exports uh, a lot to the US and also to other countries is because China has had a lot of reforms that have made it uh, more competitive. So it is like a supply shock uh, uh, that uh, comes to the rest of the world. To better uh, isolate this supply shock empirically, uh, we use so-called instrumental variable strategy where uh, we try to use the imports that other wealthy countries get from China uh, uh, as a predictor of US imports from China, that allows us to isolate that component of imports that really re represents a goods bundle that China supplies to all kinds of wealthy countries. And that is not a reaction to a specific demand shock in a specific country. Um, in other work, I should mention, we also consider a, a whole set of alternative measures of this trade shock, some of which also bring in uh, additional features like trade operating through third countries, US exports, and so forth. Now, on the data side, we construct a big data set that takes trade data, which uh, uh, customs uh, uh, collects when uh, physical goods Pass, uh, uh, the, the border, we match those goods to the kind of industries that would be producing these uh, uh, same or competing goods. We have about 400 very, very detailed manufacturing industries here. We then take uh, uh, employment values uh, for those industries uh, from uh, uh, the data called county business patterns and further merge in other uh, data sources that provide us information about characteristics of those industries. So here is one picture from, from another paper of ours that shows the trade exposure of those 400 industries. Uh, the, the, your, your focus should be mostly on the, on the, uh, on the x-axis. So industries to the right here are those that have more trade exposure. Uh, the most trade exposed um, uh, industry over that period of 91 to 2007 happens to be the raincoat industry, where uh, industries, where imports for some reason have exploded. But what's more important here to notice is uh, these different uh, symbols here capture different subgroups of manufacturing industries. The green diamonds, for instance, are textile industries uh, as well as apparel and shoe. And what you see is that there is big dispersion. 
So while there is a lot of trade competition in the raincoat industry, there isn't a lot of trade competition in various textile mill industries, or there isn't a lot of trade competition for uh, textile covers for car seats. Mm -hmm. And so that uh, uh, gives us the possibility to even compare relatively similar industries that have uh, very different exposure to that competition. Other subsectors that have a lot of exposure are uh, some types, uh, some certain machine industries. Uh, the toy industry is heavily exposed. Furniture is heavily exposed. Certain metal industry. Uh, among the transportation industries, we have a lot of exposure of bicycles, where also uh, a lot of uh, imports from China are occurring. So now we move to our first empirical exercise where we relate the log change of employment in an industry over the 1990s or the, the 2000s to this growth in import competition in that industry. We also uh, uh, want to make sure that what we're capturing here is not somehow spuriously uh, uh, just measuring some other impact that happens concurrently on those same industries. Specifically, we're trying to control for various characteristics of these industries that capture uh, uh, modes of production or the use of technologies there. In other work, we, uh, we focus much more specifically on what also computer technology and automation uh, does to those industries. Secondly, we control in some specifications for past changes in employment and wages in those industries to make sure that we're not just capturing a long-standing decline. And finally, we try to compare just subsets of industries that are more similar. Uh, what we get out of uh, all these operations are uh, uh, values that tell us that a 1% increase in trade uh, uh, in imports from China and in industry is associated with an about uh, slightly larger than one lock point or about 1% decline in employment in that competing US industry. What you have to the right of the table are specifications where we greatly narrow down the comparisons that we use. We no longer compare across all manufacturing industries, but just compare industries within textile or within the machine sector. That's the fifth and the sixth uh, uh, result here. Or in the seventh re result, we even go a step further and just compare within the same narrow industry, within raincoats, for instance, uh, uh, we look at whether uh, the timing uh, between the 1990s and the 2000s corresponds such that uh, a, a period of particularly large increases in imports also has a particularly large decline in employment. Now, from these results, we then make the next step to try to get at some headcount number of uh, employment declines. To do that, uh, we go first the standard route by uh, multiplying these uh, estimates from these regression models by uh, the observed changes in uh, the trade exposure variable. What we then do is arguably, I believe, a somewhat conservative step Namely, we multiply the product with the uh, R squared value of the first stage regression of that uh, two stage least square setup. So we associate with this Chinese supply shock only the fraction of variation in imp increasing imports that we can explain with Chinese exports to Europe. Uh, finally, we then uh, convert from the lock employment changes to head counts, and we fill in a first row uh, in a table that I will uh, uh, subsequently uh, further add to. What we find here is that these uh, estimates uh, uh, of the previous exercise, under the assumption that a uh, industry with a zero direct trade exposure indeed has zero employment effects. Under that assumption, uh, we find that uh, import competition from China accounts for about a quarter million lost jobs in the 90s and half a million lost jobs in the 2000s. Now we move to second exercise, which is to take into account that industries within the United States also trade with each other. And there are supply chains that are affected by uh, these goods imports. That impact comes uh, in uh, two different uh, types. First, uh, we have what we call here a downstream effect that is 
a, a industry J sells to a customer industry G and that customer industry G is affected by trade competition. Now, if it is the case, as we saw before, that the customer industry is constricting, then we would expect that also the firm that used to sell to that industry uh, might be suffering. The prediction is less clear when we look at the so-called upstream effect, that is a, a, a industry, uh, a J is buying its inputs from a trade exposed industry G. Here you could think, for instance, of a car manufacturer uh, that buys certain uh, uh, car parts which are now being imported from, uh, from China. Now, one possibility here, of course, is that the availability of cheaper car parts from China is actually good for the car manufacturer and allows that car manufacturer to expand its business. On the other hand, it's also possible that there are some very specific uh, uh, input-output supplier relationships and the disruption of the supply chain uh, also hurts uh, uh, in uh, that case. Uh, here are some examples of, uh, of these uh, relationships between industries. First of all, I should say that manufacturing industries mostly uh, uh, do sell to or buy from other manufacturing industries. But there are important linkages outside the manufacturing sector. A lot of mining industries, for instance, sell almost all their output to uh, manufacturing. Also, there are services industries that have a lot of ties with manufacturing. The wholesale business, for instance, buys a lot from manufacturing and also sells to manufacturing. We measure then this indirect trade exposure by taking the share of a industry's uh, J sales that go to another industry, G, and use those fractions as weights that we multiply with the direct uh, trade exposure that we measure for those customer industries G's. We sum that up over all industries that an industry J sum, uh, uh, sells to, and that gives us a measure of downstream trade exposure. Constructing upstream tra trade exposure works exactly the same way. And Moreover, we also look at a version of these shocks where we take into account higher order linkages, that is also the shock to someone's customers, customers, and so forth, and so on. Um, let me jump over that and go right uh, to the results. Here we now uh, look at models where still our outcome is the change in employment at the level of an industry, but we uh, allow now three different uh, impacts here, one coming through the direct trade exposure of those industries, one through the exposure of the customers, and one through the exposure of the suppliers. What we see uh, in the second row here is that uh, if one sells to trade exposed customers that themselves are under uh, uh, import competition pressure, then this also has negative impact effects, both for manufacturing industries that sell to exposed manufacturing sectors and for non-manufacturing industries that do the same. Excuse me? An industry. Yes. So we have here uh, two time periods with uh, uh, 392 manufacturing industries each in uh, columns one and two, and in columns four and five, that will be uh, 87 non-manufacturing sectors, again, times two periods. Now, what we see for this upstream shock, there I said here we have a potential channel through which uh, imports from China might actually create employment, namely if we have industries benefiting from these uh, cheap inputs. In column two, we see an estimate that goes a little bit in that direction, consistent with this notion that maybe manufacturing firm might be expanding if it gets cheap inputs. In the non-manufacturing sector in column five, the effect points the other way, more consistent, for instance, with a wholesale firm that used to buy inputs from the local manufacturer, and now that the local manufacturer is gone, uh, the wholesale firm is in difficulties as well. Overall, these upstream effects then turn out to be very small and uh, uh, matter little for our employment computation. What we find in that computation is that the impact of 
uh, the trade shock on manufacturing employment is almost doubled when we bring in these indirect uh, 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 relationships between industries within the United States. Also, we now find impacts on non-manufacturing industries, precisely those firms that sell to trade-exposed manufacturing businesses. And once we add additional degrees of separation, then of course more non-manufacturing businesses are somehow affected because they might be selling to some other firms which then in turn, uh, in turn sells to uh, uh, exposed business. So when we bring in all these linkages, we are now up to a, a level of uh, about two and a half uh, million jobs lost over the two decades, with nearly half of that effect coming outside of the manufacturing sector. Now, looking at industries still has us at a, uh, a uh, important challenge, which is that uh, we're still implicitly assuming in all these calculations that an industry which has neither a direct nor an indirect linkage with trade exposed manufacturing just has no uh, uh, employment change coming out of that trade shock. Indeed, we actually do have, I should say, in the data such industries which really are very, very far from uh, the trade shock and are, don't have very little uh, uh, indirect uh, exposure. Now, uh, what we can't observe in that case is that such an industry, I mentioned restaurants before, might nevertheless be affected either by uh, uh, workers re relocating from trade exposed businesses to those uh, 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 not directly or indirectly exposed industries or else by uh, demand spillovers uh, from uh, consumer spending. What we can do here, however, is to look at a, a geographic analysis where we compare basically different cities or different rural regions of the United States which are differentially specialized in the trade exposed industries. Uh, what we know from uh, earlier work that used the same social security data that Fatih uh, described uh, in, uh, this morning is that there seems to be very little geographic mobility response of workers to such local shocks. So the worker reallocation should really be to a large degree within a uh, geographic region. The spending effect is probably less geographic but the spending effect might be offsetting some of the positive uh, employment uh, uh, outcome that comes through reallocated workers. Geographically, we look at about 700 local labor markets in the US. These are clusters of <coughs> counties that have strong uh, uh, commuting relationships uh, between them. And we characterize the trade exposure of such a county cluster by uh, weighting uh, uh, with the employment fractions of industries, the, uh, the trade exposure of all the industries that are present in those local markets. Here is a map that shows the geography of that trade exposure with the darkest shaded areas being the ones that are in the highest quartile of exposure. The, uh, among larger cities, the most trade exposed place to that Chinese shock is, uh, is the region of Raleigh in North Carolina. And what happens to be the bad luck of Raleigh is that Raleigh traditionally had a very large textile uh, sector. Then with North Carolina ba basically being a large forest, they had a very important furniture operation there. And uh, in some more recent time, there was also an accumulation of electronics business and consumer electronics are yet another type of good that is heavily trade exposed. What we do then is to uh, uh, run regression models that relate the change in the employment to population ratio in such a local labor market to this change in local labor market import exposure. In some specification, we allow those effects to differ uh, or we disaggregate them for different types of industries. Let me show you that. Uh, what we see on the left is not surprisingly perhaps after the previous results that we find more trade exposed uh, uh, places to have uh, adverse employment responses. 
What we see on the right is that the adverse employment response, again, not surprisingly, happens in industries that have either a strong direct or strong indirect industry level exposure. So again, it's like those raincoats and, uh, and furniture businesses and so on that scale down. What we, however, find little clear evidence for is that there are notable local employment gains in other industries. So any worker relocation that happens, uh, for instance, to the local restaurants, to pick up my example again, seems to be largely offset by negative local uh, demand effects that counterweight that. If we convert from these regression estimates to headcounts, we interestingly come to very similar results that we had previously in the industry level analysis with about 3 million lost jobs. Uh, and these estimates here are different in the sense that the industry levels gives us uh, uh, inter-industry linkages which not only operate locally but also nationally. So in that part B, there are some employment losses included that are missing in C. In C, however, we have those local uh, uh, effects uh, which uh, uh, the previous analysis did not capture. So to sum, what we find in this paper is that there is a uh, uh, not only evidence that directly trade-exposed industries uh, are reducing their employment as a consequence, but we also find that there are uh, important spillovers, notably firms that are selling to these trade-exposed industries are also downsizing. While we try to uh, uh, allow here for potential positive or partially offsetting employment effects, either for firms benefiting from cheaper imports or by uh, workers reallocating to other industries, we find surprisingly little evidence that uh, uh, would suggest that these channels are particularly large. Now, putting this into a broader perspective, I started by saying that uh, uh, we see this reversal of employment growth in the US uh, economy that already started uh, uh, quite some years prior to the Great Recession. In terms of timing, it turns out that imports from China accelerated very sharply uh, around the start of the 2000s, and therefore uh, uh, this uh, accelerating job loss that is due to China might explain perhaps a third of the uh, accelerating job loss in manufacturing and 10% of the effect in non-manufacturing. While in this paper we study just overall employment as an outcome, of course an important question uh, uh, in relating this to inequality is what uh, kind of workers are being affected here. Now, uh, in other work we show that uh, these effects are more pronounced uh, uh, both in terms of employment and in terms of earnings declines for uh, workers with lower education levels, typically people without college degrees. Uh, men are uh, strongly uh, affected because the manufacturing sector has a largely uh, male-dominated employment in, in many areas. And in, uh, again, data that uses, uh, uh, that was also used by FATI, the social security records, we trace people over time and we see that this Im differential impact of trade shocks on different groups of workers does not just come through a effect where uh, the factory floor workers are losing their jobs and, and their managers are unaffected, but what seems to be a difference is that the less, uh, uh, the, the low income workers uh, appear to have a much more difficult time to adjusting to the shock and to find alternative employment and that uh, uh, makes them in the end much more affected by these negative shocks. Thanks. Thank you, David. The discussion is uh, uh, Joanna Stupo from uh, New York University. Thank you very much for having me and for um, giving me the opportunity to discuss this paper. Um, the starting point for this paper is the observation that David has sort of, you know, 
pointed out pretty clearly is that the decline in or the turnaround in the US labor market from going up for many decades to going down actually turned up much before the Great Recession. So since about the early 2000s, we've seen this decline in the civilian employment to population ratio. And simultaneously, we've seen a significant decline in manufacturing employment. So this is just total manufacturing employment in the US. You can see that between the 1970s and about the early 2000s, this was a pretty much a flat number, somewhere between 17 and 18 million um, employees. And that declined dramatically since then. Um, that decline um, accelerated through the Great Recession. But again, the trend was very much there since the early 2000s. And so the question that this paper is trying to address, is trying to quantify the role of import competition from China in explaining the employment decline and why does import competition from China might seem like a plausible um, explanation. It's this graph here that captures um, sort of in a picture what David mentioned on his last slide, this acceleration of import growth from China that came at around that time when China entered the WTO and when and a lot of the reforms that, um, that David mentioned came into fruition. Now, part of the story that this paper is telling, and I think telling pretty convincingly, is the idea that while most of the direct import competition happens primarily in the manufacturing sector, i.e. we don't see a lot of restaurant services being exported from China, there's actually a large number of other industries that might be affected through indirect links, um, general equilibrium channels, either through input-output linkages, um, reallocation channels, and aggregate demand channels. And so overall, I think this is a really well executed and important paper that helps us think through the distributional consequences of the expansion of global trade, and as a result, fits really nicely um, on the agenda um, of this conference. Um, and I also think you know, it, it, it's deservedly forthcoming um, in the Journal of Labor Economics. So if you want to have a look at the final paper, I think you'll find a version there relatively soon. So what I'm going to focus on in this discussion is first spend a few slides just summarizing what I took as the main takeaways from this paper. And then I want to spend a few minutes um, discussing two, two separate points. The first one is I want to try and talk about the other things that help us explain this decline in manufacturing employment. If you looked at the previous slide, you had a decline of about 6 million jobs were lost in manufacturing. You know, depending on which of the estimates of, of, of David's work you're going to take as your baseline, you can explain some of in a quarter and a third of that. What are the other things that are going on throughout this period? What are the, and, and then the second thing I want to do is I want to talk about other impacts of this trade with China. Tra a trade, as I, as I already mentioned, has these large distributional consequences, one of them being this displacement of a large number of manufacturing jobs in the US. But what are the other important features of this trade with China that we need to think about in terms of uh, a, gra a greater cost-benefit analysis of this trade opening and in terms of the impact on income inequality and growth in the US? Um, so I'm going to try and do it in pictures, what, what David did in, in, in equations which is the baseline specification is just the following idea. There's different industries in the US, different manufacturing industries that are differentially affected by this import competition from China. And so when you basically go back to the 1990s and you look at an industry that saw a lot of subsequent imports from China and an industry that didn't see a large growth in imports from China, if you compare the relative employment measures between the two, that gives you a sense of the impact that this import competition has had on those jobs. Now, there's a problem with just the basic OLS regression, which is this is clear on endogeneity concern, which is that the change in the import competition between the baseline year 1990 and today might well not be driven by something that's going on in China, but it might well be something that's driven by for example, problems in that manufacturing sector in the US. And so the, the identification strategy that the authors are running is this instrumental variable strategy that David described, which is basically they're saying the following. Look, we're really worried that there's something in the US industry that's going on that's explaining this change in income po import competition as well as the change in the job loss. So what we're going to do instead is we're not going to see how import competition to US manufacturing changed, but we're going to sort of proxy for that change by looking at changes in import competition from China in other developed countries, say Europe. Um, the idea here is that most of the effect was this China supply shock, right? this deregulation and, um, and the joining of the WTO that led to a growth of imports across all countries. And the key idea here is that those input demand shocks, those industry-specific shocks that we are worried about, they are likely to be uncorrelated across industries in developed countries. Um, the paper doesn't actually go in a huge amount of detail justifying that they refer to some earlier work by a subset of the authors for that. And you know, if I have a few comments, despite the relatively advanced nature of the paper, I think it would be worthwhile just spending a bit of time, even in this paper, just justifying that assumption. Um, if you do that, that gets you about $560,000, uh, 
560,000 jobs lost in US manufacturing between 1999 and 2011. Now, the second important channel that the authors focus on, and I think really here comes the, the sort of the contribution, is the idea that while a lot of the direct import competition only hits those manufacturing sectors that produce the same goods as Chinese um, companies do, there's both suppliers and purchasers of, um, of those companies that are also affected. So let's take an upstream industry like the iron ore industry. The iron ore industry sells products to US car manufacturers. And so if US car manufacturers run into trouble, they're going to buy less iron ore from the US iron ore producers. And that might well lead to job losses in those upstream industries that are now losing their suppliers. Similarly, the downstream industries. Right? So that U.S. car manufacturer is maybe a bad example, but other industries, they sell products to downstream firms, and those downstream firms might also be affected. Now here, the effect is less obvious, because you're going to have a positive effect. Those people that previously had to buy from U.S. manufacturing firms now can buy a lot of their inputs cheaper from Chinese firms. So that might actually lead to an increase in employment in those firms. On the other hand, you have this potential negative effect that there's these well-established supplier um, relationships that might be hurt and that might actually disrupt employment in those industries too. And so what the authors are doing in this part of the paper is they're, and I think this is a really cool part, they're exploiting the entire input-output matrix in the US to estimate the total sum of all of these effects, first linkage, but then even, you know, the, the iron ore industry might buy goods from somewhere else and there's also an effect going there. And so, um, and so when you add all of these up, you get about a million jobs directly lost in manufacturing through this. But what I thought was sort of the most surprising result of this paper, you're going to get another almost a million jobs lost in non-manufacturing sectors that don't face any direct import competition from China whatsoever. Right? So those are sort of the, 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 the two sort of industry level focus specifications. And then the third one is, and David described this also, which is the idea, look, if there is a U.S. manufacturing plant that closes down in a particular local labor market, commuting zone, whatnot, that has at least two other ways in which it would affect employment in the U.S. The first one is this positive reallocation effect. Right? So you now have all of these workers that were previously employed in this manufacturing plant that you might be able to hire for cheap in some other sector and, um, and, you know, and as wages, for example, decline in those areas, and that might actually mean some reabsorption of these employees in other sectors. And the second part is this aggregate demand effect, this aggregate demand story, which is that these guys that are now unemployed, that can't work for these uh, manufacturing firms anymore, they're going to buy fewer goods. And that's going to lead to a decline in demand for a lot of other firms, both in manufacturing but also in services. And as a result, we're going to see a decline in, um, in employment through that channel potential. Now, when the, when the authors do the empirical work here, they arrive at a total employment effect. Of, um, of this import penetration from China of about 2.4 million workers. And one of the things that surprised me in this paper is that actually you see very, very similar effects for tradable and non-tradable sectors within these commuting zones. Let me briefly explain what that means. You have the restaurant example that David gave, which is basically where most of the demand is coming from people living in that area. That's a non-tradable sector. And then you have a tradable sector, which basically might be another car plant, where really very little of the demand is coming from people living in the area, but they're selling their product within the entire country. Now, this aggregate demand effect should only hit the local businesses, or should hit the local businesses differentially hard relative to the people that sell across the country. But the authors don't find that, which is somewhat in contrast, for example, with work that Artif has done with Amir, and I think maybe spending a bit more time trying to reconcile why it is that you don't find differential effect for tradable and non-tradable, I think, would be sort of a worthwhile direction to think about. So that kind of gives us the, the channels that the authors are capturing. Um, I actually think a lot of these channels are understating the full effect of what's going on with import penetration from China. So the first two pictures I showed you were these industry level effects. And they basically cannot capture the aggregate demand effects or the spillovers from, um, from factor reallocation, which is why the authors moved to the local commuting zone estimates. But those local commuting zone estimates are also missing some important channels. Um, most importantly, they're missing the impact on um, tradable industry employment in other parts of the US. So if people in a local labor market are unemployed, they're going to buy fewer cars. A lot of those car manufacturers sit all around the US. They might be able to hire fewer people. And, um, and so we're going to see some unemployment there. So, um, so overall, I think the effects are going to understate the total effect of the employment. 
So where does it leave us with respect to this manufacturing employment, right? So we find that there's this, import, this input penetration has very significant effects on manufacturing sector employment. Let's take around number one million of the jobs lost over the, you know, the 1999 to today period can be directly attributed to this import growth from China. There's also these additional employment effects in non-manufacturing sectors. But overall, we saw this second picture I had up showed a total employment decline of about 6 million jobs. Right? So I want to spend a bit of time trying to throw out a few other factors that are also going on during this time period that help us complete the picture about why US manufacturing has <laughs> performed so abysmally. So the first one is, and that's kind of a secular trend that's been going on for quite a while, is that the total share of global GDP, global value added that's coming from manufacturing, has been declining for many, many years. This is a demand effect. A lot more of our consumption is services, a lot less is manufactured good. So this is a picture from, um, from the McKinsey Global Institute. The orange line here is for the entire world, and you can see that the GDP comp component of, uh, com made up by manufacturing has been declining substantially for long periods of time. It's been declining for almost all parts of the world. Only low-income countries have had the GDP share of manufacturing increase. The second part is that share of that total global GDP um, from manufacturing that's generated in the US. That's really what this paper is focusing on, right? Um, and then the last factor is the number of workers that are required to produce this output, right? Autom automation, technological change in that manufacturing sector has been a key input that we need fewer and fewer workers actually producing the same amount of output. And here in this graph, the black line is the same employment numbers I had up before. The gray line here is um, labor productivity in the manufacturing sector, and that's been going up a lot. So a lot of the declines in employment here are not just coming because American firms are selling fewer manufactured goods because they're all buying them from China. It's also because the American firms need fewer workers to produce the same amount of manufactured goods. And then, you know, labor supply effects, which very often are popular explanations, demographics, taxes. Robert Moffitt, the paper that, uh, that David cited in the beginning, has actually shown those aren't really key factors of what's going on. Okay. So the last thing I want to focus on is um, trying to, you know, think a bit more about sort of the broader impacts of um, import penetration and, and, you know, an increasing, um, increasing trade. Because I think what this paper has shown pretty convincingly is that while free trade be maybe good overall, and the paper takes no stance on that whatsoever, and there's very important distributional consequences that come from it, um, in particular in terms of job displacement um, within the US. And you see the impact of those distributional consequences showing up all along the political debate, anywhere from ranging from anti-dumping duties, if you remember the debate about Chinese tires and how we have to stop them from coming into the country, onto the debate about Chinese currency manipulation, right? The only reason they can export so much to us and destroy our jobs is because they're keeping the currency artificially cheap. If you look at where a lot of the political support for these debates come from, if you overlay that with the map that David had earlier on about the regions that are most hit by this import penetration, I wouldn't be surprised if you saw a pretty sizable correlation of that. Um, now, other things that we need to think about in terms of what does trade do to help us you know, get at this picture of you know, changes in inequality and, and, and changes in, in growth over, uh, you know, sort of as a bigger picture. So the first one is impact on wages, right? Some jobs disappear altogether. Other jobs might become very low-wage jobs. And, you know, and a subset of the authors from this paper has done a lot of work showing that not only do jobs disappear, those jobs that stay actually have lower wages. And I think that's something that contributes to this increase in inequality. Um, there's also another important part which you can't really measure in income or wealth inequality. Um, but that's, it actually has a lot of positive welfare impacts for U.S. consumers to be able to buy these Chinese manufactured goods for cheaper. That's something that we can't forget, even if it doesn't show up in wealth or income inequality numbers. Um, another part is who's producing in China. So is these Chinese companies or are these U.S. companies offshoring to China? The reason I'm saying this is because a lot of that surplus that gets generated I mean, we have to think about who are the shareholders. Are these US-based shareholders that are benefiting from this, or are these Chinese shareholders? You know, to the extent that we care about distributional, both between countries and within countries, I think these are very important things to think about. And then finally, and this is sort of a, a related research agenda that Nick Bloom and, 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 and John van Rien and, and, and Draka have had, is the idea that actually import competition and having to compete with Chinese manufacturers forces firms to invest in innovation and to produce and, and to, to boost productivity. So they've got um, an interesting paper and some follow-up work looking at showing that a 10% rise in Chinese import is associated with an increase of 3.2% in patent filing and 12% in R&D. 
and they do a back of the envelope calculation. Their estimates are all looking at, at the European economy, which is they show that 15% of technical change in Europe between 2000 and 2007 can be attributed to firms responding to facing this import competition from China. So thinking about growth, right, it might actually mean fewer jobs, but it means you know those jobs might be more productive and that can contribute to economic growth. Um, in terms of inequality in a bigger picture, I think Marcus's comment last night was very sort of was very pertinent here, which is the idea that yes, these jobs are no longer in the US, they're now in China, but in terms of thinking about inequality on a global scale, you know, while a lot of the 1% income inequality in the US has gone up, I think global income inequality has declined, and a lot of that is because there's now better paying jobs out in China. And then, very finally, this might be slightly more forward-looking than backward-looking, which is that while China has been, for the past you know, 20 years, mainly a manuf the manufacturing house of the world, they might very well become a consumption house of the world. So this was only last week or two weeks ago. Apple is now selling more iPhones in China than it is in the US. And I think that's a trend that's likely to continue and, again, is going to contribute to, um, to some, you know, is going to have important distributional consequences and it's going to be an important fact when we think about um, the welfare consequences of this increased global trade. Thank you. Thank you, John. Nice. David, do you want to take uh, just uh, half a minute to respond? Uh. OK, maybe I take uh, two half minutes. <laughs> uh, let me quickly start by, uh, by the reference to uh, Atif Mian's work. So uh, Atif showed with uh, his co-author that uh, regions in the US that are hit particularly hard by, uh, by the housing crisis have uh, greater declines in uh, local uh, employment in so-called non-traded industries like in the restaurants that really depend on the local customers compared to industries that sell in the whole country. Uh, Johannes has picked up that we try to do this distinguish in our analysis. However, we distinguish a third group. We distinguish first the directly trade exposed industries and then among those with no trade exposure we try to compare the tradables and non-tradables. As it turns out, the group of industries that is tradable within the US but not exposed to China is very small. So that might be a reason why we don't find very clear results there. Now, in the bigger picture, uh, what's very important to point out uh, uh, is that even if we come to the conclusion that there are employment effects of trade competition, then this uh, is not a manifesto against uh, free trade. Uh, it is important to realize that the benefits of, uh, of trade will, uh, uh, for instance, accrue to consumers uh, uh, through lower prices, uh, which is something we don't uh, uh, look at here. It's also important to realize that there might be some dynamic benefits as, uh, as uh, uh, trade stimulating uh, research. Even though last month uh, in the American Economic Association meeting I presented some preliminary res results showing that these European uh, results for trade stimulating research don't, uh, 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 are not found when we look at US data. All right. Uh, any questions from the audience? I found it very interesting, and I'm going to use your county clusters uh, work for something I'm, I'm working on, uh, to get a sense of what the impact effects of this is, and it kind of corroborates the sense I've had of the power of this. But it seems to me it's, we have to be very careful not to go from these results to say these are the aggregate employment impacts from this. And remember, at least some of us in this room are macroeconomists, that there are things like monetary policy that regulate the level of employment and unemployment. And I think it's very clear during the first part of your period that monetary policy was restraining the growth of jobs. And then after 2007 was ineffective in containing the drop in jobs. And since then has very and more explicitly than in the past had job creation as its principal objective. So in the end of the day, I think it's still true when we look at the U.S. economy, this may have an impact effect. It may, in the end, result in a mis redistribution of where those jobs are, uh, 
Uh, but the total jobs in the economy are a result of uh, what the Fed decides the economy can take. If you want to respond. Okay. Um, so, so uh, what, what you, what you uh, raise here, of course, also corresponds to what my discussant has said, right? There are many other things going on that also affect employment, and, uh, and, and, and there is uh, uh, certainly no debate about that. That's, that's absolutely clear. And as you've seen also, we, uh, we only say that we believe that China contributes some percentage to those job changes uh, that we saw. If you... Uh, David, I had a question about how you are computing the aggregate numbers uh, to translate your estimates uh, up to the economy. And if I understood you correctly, you, you mentioned using the R squared of the first mm -hmm. stage. Now, the first stage is a cross-sectional first stage, right? Is that like in, in your? Yes. It's a, it's, it's a cross-sectional first stage. But what you're trying to get at in the aggregate number is you're trying to estimate the total economy-wide it's kind of the aggregate time series effect. So in a, in a way, you're trying to map the cross-sectional R-square to the time series R-square that we actually never observe, really, because we can never run the count. You know, we don't have an instrument in the aggregate, of, of course. Otherwise, we would not need to do that. So there is an assumption there that whatever your R-square is, 60%, that is a legitimate interpretation in the cross-section, that that is 60% of the cross-sectional variation can be explained by this supply shock or whatever you want to call it by the shock that you're interested in but it's not clear or obvious to me that if it's 60 percent in the cross section then it should be 60 percent of the time series variation as well I mean that's that's a leap you're, you're taking and I, I I don't know if you have I mean it's fine it's not it's not really a criticism but I'm, I'm, I'm one if I, I think you one needs to think a little bit more in terms of how legitimate that kind of an assumption is because uh, the question is really important in terms of mapping the cross-sectional into the aggregate. Yeah, so the, what we're using is precisely the first stage from that same regression, industry level regression, right? Where we have two time periods for each industry. So there is both time series variation and cross-sectional uh, uh, variation in there for those industries. But of course, as you see, this, this is just sort of a very, very rough adjustment. You can, uh, s since this is just like all the very, all the, the head counts being multiplied with that number, you can also very easily multiply that out or uh, uh, change it with a, with a different number. Presumably also, the effect of Chinese imports to the US was to reduce America's inflation rate and therefore presumably reduce policy interest rates. Uh, and presumably also, there was a massive balance of payments surplus in China, which China tended to invest in U.S. Treasuries. So U.S. interest rates right across the curve would have been reduced quite markedly by, by this uh, opening up and unevaluation of Chinese exchange rate and so on. I mean, that presumably must have had quite an effect on U.S. employment as well. Perhaps in the construction sector, it may not have been very <laughs> helpful, but nevertheless an important effect, a positive effect on, on China, uh, American employment. Yes, I mean, this, this is certainly a, a very interesting additional channel. It is, to my best knowledge, also an underexplored path, with, probably precisely because it's rather hard to quantify, would be my sense. So I'm not sure whether we actually have an estimate on what you know, Chinese purchases of uh, US bonds really have done quantitatively to the, the prevailing interest rates or the interest rates that companies would face that want to take out credit. <laughs> Emmanuel? I was wondering if you had uh, enough data to be able to look at how the effects played out over time. So the large things, for example, the, the adjustment of wages or uh, reallocation through search and things like that, that you would imagine would play out differently at different time horizons. <coughs> Yeah, so uh, here, here we're sort of in a, in, a, in a very aggregate scenario where we really just try to explain these uh, two relatively long time periods and are uh, uh, somewhat agnostic about how things distribute out within these time periods. Uh, in other work that I've mentioned, we trace individual people over time and there we sort of see more of the really detailed dynamic of how 
uh, these careers evolve. And interestingly, what you see there is even at the level of individuals, people who in the, at the start of the 1990s uh, were employed, for instance, in the raincoat industry, you see that sort of compared to other people in a less exposed industry, their, their, uh, their earnings just start declining in the 90s and then in the 2000s as imports ramp up, the earnings differential also quickly becomes larger. All right, so we are eating the time of uh, the next sec session, so let's uh, stop here. Uh, thank you, uh, David and Jonas, again for the excellent presentation and discussion.